So I would like to turn it over to our special guest speaker. Frank Perry was actually the person giving the talk on my very first day of work here about a year and a half ago, so I'm happy that he, he came back. Um, some of you might have been here as well for that Wharves of Santa Cruz County talk. It was awesome. And I think tonight's talk will be just as impressive. So I will let Frank tell you more about him and his knowledge of local history and this museum and all of the people that have shaped it throughout the last 110 and more years, I believe. So please give Frank a warm welcome. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me here this evening. Uh, it's, uh, it's real nice to see so many uh, friends here in the audience tonight. Uh, as some of you know, I uh, grew up in the Santa Cruz area, and my parents would frequently uh, bring me uh, here to this museum uh, when I was a child. In fact, I remember coming here on a school trip to learn about the Native Americans back in about 19... 61, I think it was. <laughs> so uh, I have a long connection with this place. My parents would also once in a while take me over to uh, the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History. So I think I grew up thinking that all towns about this side ha size had natural history museums. Well, of course, that's not true. A lot of towns have historical museums, but natural sciences museums are are much less common except for in the big cities. So that makes this museum very special. It's also very special because it has such a long history. As Elizabeth said, uh, this Saturday the museum is going to be celebrating 110 years. Uh, in fact, uh, as before that, as a, as a private collection, uh, it goes back several decades earlier. So uh, let's uh, Maybe just reduce uh, a few of the lights, and uh, we'll get started here. There, can you all see that all right? I guess so. OK. And it's in focus, I hope. All right, so we'll get started. So this museum uh, got its uh, uh, start as a public museum in 1905 when uh, this woman, mm -hmm. Laura Hecox, who was a local uh, naturalist and also the lighthouse keeper in Santa Cruz, uh, donated her private collections uh, to the people of Santa Cruz. So Laura Hecox, in fact, the whole Hecox family is, is quite fascinating, really an amazing uh, history. Uh, her parents, Adna and Margaret Hecox, and several of her older siblings uh, came across the plains by wagon train in 1846. That was the same year that the uh, Donner Party met uh, tragedy trying to cross the Sierra. That was such a long time ago when the, the Hecox family first started out from Missouri, California was still part of Mexico. And then when they got here, there was a war going on. Uh, that's a, a book that you can actually uh, check out of the public library, uh, Margaret Hecox's story of the crossing. And it's a lot of fun to read, especially if you're stuck in an airport. Uh, <laughs> you don't worry about that extra hour or two when you read their, their story of uh, crossing the plains. So uh, after the Hecox family got here, they had several more children, including uh, Matilda and James and Lo Laura and Orville. Uh, this is a picture of Laura Hecox when she was quite young, maybe still a teenager, it looks like. Uh, she was born in Santa Cruz in 1854. So what was Santa Cruz like in 1854? You know, that's, it's just hard to imagine. One clue, it turns out that the United States Coast Survey uh, did a map of Santa Cruz in 1854. And this is what it looked like. The little black uh, squares and rectangles are buildings. So this is the Mission Plaza. Uh, this is Pacific Avenue. No buildings on Pacific Avenue yet. A few on Front Street, a few other. But it was a town of just a few hundred people. Well, that's very important. You have to remember that Laura Hecox uh, you know, grew up in a, a very small town and didn't have anything like the kind of resources that we have 
today, so that makes what she accomplished uh, even more uh, impressive. In 1869, her uh, father was appointed as keeper of the Santa Cruz Lighthouse. Uh, Santa Cruz was an important seaport back then. A lot of goods were being shipped out of here, like uh, lumber and lime and leather and various agricultural products. And several ships a day would come in and out of Santa Cruz. So in 1869, the federal government built a lighthouse out on what became Lighthouse Point and appointed Mr. Hecox as the keeper. And there's an early picture of uh, the lighthouse. Uh, uh, pretty small and not much else around in that picture. Excuse me, is that a Moybridge photo? Yes. You know, I left that name on the side there just for the photography fans out there. <laughs> Edward Moybridge was a very famous uh, photographer. So Adna Hecox died in 1883, and his daughter Laura had been helping him some uh, run the lighthouse in his last years because he was getting kind of sick. And so when he died, uh, a lot of the townspeople campaigned to get the federal government to appoint his daughter Laura uh, lighthouse keeper to replace him. And that's exactly what happened. As a lighthouse keeper, she had to keep the light burning uh, each night and keep the place all uh, clean, polish the lens, polish the brass, all the same kind of stuff that was done at all the different uh, lighthouses up and down the coast back then. Uh, this is a picture of Laura Hecox and her mother on the back porch of the lighthouse. And this little thing here, that's actually the light for the lighthouse. It's just a little kerosene, uh, like a parlor lamp. <laughs> but the great uh, lens uh, magnified it and focused it so efficiently that it could be seen about uh, 10 miles out to sea. Well, in 1879, this uh, book was uh, published. Uh, I love the title, Santa Cruz County, California, illustrations descriptive of its scenery, fine residences, public buildings, manufactories, homes, farm scenes, business, how houses, schools, churches, mines, mills, etc., cetera, et cetera, from original drawings by artists of the highest quality or highest ability with historical sketch of the county. Uh, this was published by the Wallace W. Elliott Company of San Francisco in 1879, and those of us who are historians, we refer to the book as Elliott. Uh, Elliot's uh, very important in this story because it has a very long biography of uh, Adna Hecox, and right near the end, it tells us a little bit about Laura. Miss Laura J. Hecox resides with her parents. This young lady is quite a student of conchology, and her display of shells and cabinet specimens is greatly admired by all who visit the lighthouse. So we know that she had a display already at the lighthouse uh, in the 1870s. We don't know very much about her childhood, but there are a few clues that have turned up. Uh, here's a picture of her collection of shells in the lighthouse. It's uh, her father uh, did woodworking and built some of the cabinets for her. In 1880, October of 1880, uh, this woman, uh, Caroline Dahl, visited Santa Cruz. She was an intellectual from Boston, a feminist and transcendentalist. And she came out here to Santa Cruz to uh, visit with some of her uh, like-minded uh, friends. And one of the people she visited was uh, Laura Hecox. And this is what she wrote. There, Miss Hecox came to meet us. She is the daughter of the keeper, a woman about 28 years old. She is supposed to have had a fall in infancy, which occasioned first convulsions, and then a paralysis of one side. Many a child would have been soured by her fate, but Laura soon began to take pleasure in the study of shells, until she is quite an authority on this coast. 
and very useful to many more famous collectors by exchanging or forwarding what they want. Through the kindness of such persons, she has accumulated a pretty museum, which her father has been proud to set up. It is the only trace of luxury in the simple house. There's another version of the story. There was a fictionalized account of her life uh, written, and it's a little bit different. And, and in that story, we don't know for sure if this is true, but parts of the story are definitely true, parts are definitely not true. But this particular part says that when Laura Hecox was a child, she'd had a fall and had a brain injury. And while she was sitting on the beach one day, another little girl gave her a seashell. And Laura Hecox was so fascinated by the seashells that she started looking for them along the beach, started collecting them, uh, putting together all the ones that were the same kind, and learning to identify them. And this study uh, helped her regain some of her uh, mental abilities. And in fact, uh, I used to know a fellow who uh, suffered uh, brain damage in a motorcycle accident, and he took up the collecting of old postcards. And he said the same thing. It was therapy for him. Another view of uh, Laura and her mother on the steps of the lighthouse, taken, I believe, uh, 1888. Well, Laura set up a private museum in the lighthouse. As a government lighthouse, she had to, by law, she was required to give uh, tours on a regular basis, at least once or twice a week. So people would get to see her little private museum in the lighthouse. And it's clear from studying about her life that she had this museum gig figured out. She did all the things you're supposed to do if you're running a museum. She uh, numbered and cataloged her collection. She uh, gave, as I said, tours, uh, public tours. Uh, she wrote articles about scientific subjects. Uh, she belonged to scientific societies, or at least one society that we know of for sure. And she did special exhibits once a year at the county fair. And uh, if, say, the high school biology class was doing a unit on birds, uh, she'd go and set up a bird display uh, at the library so the students could uh, see it. A friend of mine at the California Academy of Sciences uh, found this. This is a directory of uh, American uh, conchologists, about 1890. And you can see her name there on the list. Uh, the Pacific Rural Press, which was a popular uh, newspaper in the 1880s and 1890s, uh, would publish a list of uh, naturalists in, Santa Cru in uh, California and list what they were interested in uh, trading with other uh, naturalists who were collectors. And her name is on that list as well. This is the only article I've ever found that she wrote. It came out of uh, one of her scrapbooks, an article on chitons. Would love to find more articles like this. Uh, from the way it's written, it sounds like it's part of a series, but we don't know just where it was published. She corresponded with a lot of uh, scientists of the day. Uh, a scientist back east who studied land mollusks actually named a uh, variety of banana slug in her honor. Now, you can't get much more Santa Cruz-y than that. Uh, Ralph Arnold, who was a paleontologist with the US Geological Survey, uh, wrote this about uh, Laura that you can read there. And he named a uh, species of fossil uh, spindle shell from the San Lorenzo Valley after her. It's this one right here. Laura Hecox was not famous, but she was well known. Uh, Bay Area newspapers would do stories about her once in a while. And, uh, and there were some national stories about her. And as this little article says, she is one of the best known lighthouse keepers on the coast. Uh, there were other people uh, who had little museums in Santa Cruz in the late 1800s. This was, after all, the heyday of natural history. Natural history study was extremely popular. People didn't have radios or 
televisions or DVD players or the internet, so they'd get together and uh, look at diatoms under a microscope. <laughs> and, uh, they, they really did, uh, things like that. Uh, there's, this was a fellow who had a uh, little museum on Pacific Avenue in Santa Cruz. Uh, the Anderson sisters tried to make a living selling uh, pressed seaweed and ferns. Uh, there was a free cliff museum out at the end of Woodrow Avenue. This is a postcard from about 1910. Uh, supposedly it had a live sea lion. In 1904, Santa Cruz got a brand new library financed by Andrew Carnegie. It was located at the same spot as the present main library downtown. And as soon as it was, when it was built, it uh, initially had extra space in it. It had some empty rooms, including the room on the lower right there, a basement room. And uh, one of the library trustees got the idea of uh, setting up a museum in the library. Uh, this is Charles Lewis Anderson, who was a medical doctor here in Santa Cruz, but his hobby was natural history, and it was a very serious study for him. He also corresponded with a lot of Eastern scientists. He, he specialized in marine algae. He was very influential in those days because he wrote a lot of articles in the newspaper, and he also uh, was on the school board and on the library board. So he persuaded Laura Hecox to donate her collection uh, to the library for exhibit there. Here's some drawings by uh, Mr. A Dr. Anderson of uh, different kinds of uh, kelp from Monterey Bay. It's interesting, I was looking at the names and names haven't changed all that much. This is 1895. So in, uh, after uh, the library was built, a bunch of volunteers got together to fix up that basement room, ready to receive uh, Laura's uh, collection. And on August 21st, 1905, uh, the Hecox <coughs> Museum opened at the Santa Cruz Public Library. This was an article in the Santa Cruz Surf about the opening I, uh, I love the first line. It says, a large number of Santa Cruz citizens and citizenesses <laughs> called at the free library. <laughs> well, Laura, according to the surf, Laura Hecox uh, said this. She said, the lighthouse, or, or they said that she said, the lighthouse keeper, as usual, took all the compliments paid her most graciously, and in a little speech later on said that she did not feel that she was losing anything in giving the collection, but that she was merely taking everyone else into partnership with her in the enjoyment of the collection. So I thought that was a pretty nice thing to say. A picture of uh, Laura in later years, that's her uh, there. Gray hair now. Uh, this is her sister Matilda, and this is her sister Alwilda. Alwilda and her husband traveled all around the West. They were uh, evangelists. I should mention that uh, Matilda had a daughter, uh, Daisy. Her name was Matilda Longley, and she had a daughter, Daisy Longley who has one of my favorite names in Santa Cruz County history. She, Daisy married a Dr. Benjamin Plant and became Daisy Plant. <laughs> <laughs> After about 10 years, the library's book collection grew and grew, and they really needed that basement room uh, for books, so the Hecox uh, Museum was moved to the then new Santa Cruz High School. Well, now we're going to start over again with a new story, kind of another influx into the story of the history of the museum. Uh, in 1929, uh, this fellow, Humph Humphrey Pilkington, uh, passed away and bequeathed his collection of 
Native American artifacts uh, to the city of Santa Cruz, providing that the city uh, would create a museum to house it. Pilkington, another very interesting person, the nephew of the man for whom this street out here was named. Uh, Humphrey Pilkington was the first warden, what you now call head ranger, at uh, Big Basin Redwood State Park. He was an agriculturalist. He went to UC Berkeley, studied agriculture, and advised other farmers around Santa Cruz on what kind of crops they, sh they should grow and how they should grow them. He was also the first uh, head of the local Department of Weights and Measures. He uh, would travel uh, up to Northern California during his life and buy uh, artifacts of different kinds and bring them back for his collection. So he had quite a large and uh, beautiful uh, collection. Well, a committee was uh, formed to try and find a location to, for the Pilkington Museum. And they looked at uh, the area around the start of the wharf, probably about where the uh, uh, Sanctuary Center is now. Uh, they looked at the School Street, Adobe, and several other locations, but they didn't have any money to build a museum. And if they didn't have some kind of museum, the collection would go to UC Berkeley. So this fellow uh, was, uh, is uh, Robert Burton, who was a teacher at the Santa Cruz High School at the time, a science teacher and a personal friend of Humphrey Pilkington. So he worked hard to try and find a, a better museum uh, location. Uh, and the spot they settled on was this building called the Crafts House out in Tyrrell Park in Seabright. This house originally uh, belonged to uh, William Tyrrell. It is said that he uh, built it partly out of wood that he dragged up off, the sea, off of uh, Seabright Beach. <laughs> it was kind of an odd looking house. Tyrrell passed away and his uh, niece uh, donated the house and all the land for the creation of Tyrrell Park. So this crafts house was used by the Seabright community for uh, quite a while. They had uh, artists and different kinds of classes and meetings there. But when they heard that uh, the building was wanted for a museum, they said, well, that, that's a, a greater cause. Let's, let's make it into a museum. So the Pilkington Museum was moved to the crafts house uh, to here in Terrell Park uh, temporarily in 1930. There's a view, you can see this building in the distance there on the right. That's uh, Pilkington Avenue. Another close up, it was kind of an oddly shaped building. <laughs> so now we begin with uh, the museum's, uh, what I call the roller coaster ride with the city of Santa Cruz. <laughs> Um, now, an obvious person to be on the museum committee, the formal committee appointed by the city council to run the museum, would be Robert Burton. He helped organize it. He knew Humphrey Pilkington. But the mayor at that time was Fred Swanton. And when Fred Swanton looked at the list of uh, possible appointees, he said, Burton, I don't want Burton on there. Apparently Burton had opposed him on some uh, plan that Swanton had, and so uh, Burton didn't get uh, selected, at least not right away. After the collection was set up here, people realized, well, it would be good to bring the Hecox collection over here, too, and combine them and have them both in one museum. Uh, so this man, who uh, was an early curator here, Jed Scott, I uh, was one of those who helped bring the Hecox collection over from the high school, and it was finally all set up here in 1932. Uh, George Croydon, another Seabright uh, civic leader, also uh, helped with that. As you can see, Jed Scott was interested in Native American artifacts <laughs> as well. This was his uh, Scott at home in uh, Sacramento. 
and another key person in the early years nineteen thirty s forty s and possibly into the early fifty's was mina and worth mina and worth taught english at santa cruz high school but she lived in the little house just right over here you got that door look right across the gulch that was her house so she could she was right next door to the terrell house and she was the museum secretary and treasurer for over twenty years another view of the terrell house I read something rather sad and about the transfer of the Hecox collection over here. Uh, uh, Robert uh, Burton was uh, trying to get things organized for the move, and it said in a newspaper article that the Hecox collection had not fared well at the high school. A lot of things had gotten broken, labels had gotten lost, things had been misplaced. So uh, Scott and Croydon and others mm -hmm. have spent a lot of time trying to identify and and reclassify uh, things uh, when it got here. This is part of the, one of the mu old museum accession books. S shows a donation by Norman Pendleton in 1939. The museum really has uh, wonderful records uh, going all the way back to the, the Laura Hecox period. Was she still alive by this time? Oh, I should mention she died in 1919. Okay. Yeah. So no, she was not alive. Inside of the uh, museum, early 1940s. Museum letterhead, Santa Cruz Museum and Santa Cruz Aquarium, which I'll explain in a moment. So at that time, uh, well, Scott and Croydon died in the mid-1930s and some new people came along. Uh, Fred Swanton was no longer mayor, so uh, Robert Burton, <laughs> finally got uh, appointed, and also uh, Norman Pendleton, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Turver, Harry Turver and Mary Turver, uh, John Strobean, and uh, Mina Unsworth. Well, I'll tell you, uh, with the exception of Mina Unsworth, who was an English teacher, if you were trying to put a, together a collection of the best uh, citizen naturalists in Santa Cruz in the late 30s, and early 40s, this would be the list. Some really amazing people. Let me get this thing to work here. Uh, Robert uh, Burton, as I say, taught uh, biology and chemistry and forestry at Santa Cruz High School. So he, in that sense, was a professional scientist. He also uh, traveled uh, quite extensively. He, uh, during the war, he worked for the Navy uh, in the South Seas, setting up agricultural uh, programs on islands to grow vegetables for the American soldiers and taught for a while at the University of Hawaii. Uh, here he was on some, uh, this is 1934, doing agricultural work, but he was with a group that uh, discovered dinosaur tracks. And he had a regular series of articles in the newspaper called In Search of Santa Cruz. And they're worth going back and reading. Uh, very very uh, interesting articles. He did one on Neri Lagoon and the San Lorenzo River and Poganip and a lot of the same place, places that uh, we're so interested in today as well. This is John Strobean, another amazing person. I call these people the, the supernaturalists. You know, by day, he was a mild-mannered telephone repairman. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in the evenings and on weekends, he uh, morphed into the supernaturalist. Uh, Strobean not only collected marine life, uh, well, he was interested in all kinds of things, but his specialty was butterflies. And in an article uh, in the Sentinel in 1941, he said, it, said he had a personal collection of 35,000 butterfly <laughs> specimens. He even had a butterfly named in his honor. That, that you're a real naturalist when somebody names something for you. Uh, this was a subspecies called Strobeans parnassian. He discovered it here in Santa Cruz in the 1920s, and it looked something like that. 
this is the species, not the subspecies, but it'd be very close. Hasn't been seen alive since 1958. So if you see one, let me know. <laughs> Not likely at this point, I'm afraid. And another person on the board at that time was Norman Pendleton. And I am, feel very fortunate in that I actually got to personally know Norman Pendleton a little bit in the 1980s. Uh, his specialty was minerals. Uh, he donated his uh, collection to UCSC. You can see some of it in the Earth and Marine Sciences building there. Uh, when I was setting up that display, I asked him to, to give me a picture. And this is the best he would give me. <laughs> Wanted to put his picture in the exhibit. But he was a very modest person. And uh, so I got a picture of him taking home movies of a cactus. <laughs> uh, that's his wife, uh, Gertrude. And uh, Norman Pendleton uh, started out as a florist. Then later on, he and his wife ran the uh, Lucky Stone Motel on Ocean Street. Uh, he said, now, you, you would think as a florist, when I was you know, courting my wife, I, I would have given her lots of flowers. And he said, actually, he gave her rocks. <laughs> And I, a few years ago, I actually found a postcard of the Lucky Stone Motel. <laughs> it says on the back that every person who stays there gets a free Lucky Stone. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, got a whole bunch of little crystals, which are called starlight, which are twin crystals that make a cross. It's known as a Lucky Stone or as a fairy cross. So he would give these out to all the uh, customers. And there's uh, his collection, which you can uh, see at UCSC. Yeah, his house was right behind the motel. And he and his wife were real smart. They, when they built the house, they built a full basement, which is rare for Santa Cruz. And the entire basement was a mineral museum. Well, finally, we come to another uh, uh, couple of people who were very, very important amazing people, Harry and Mary Turber, who got involved with the museum in the late 30s and were involved for eight or 10 years. Harry uh, liked paleontology and also marine life. I asked uh, Norman Pendleton if he remembered the Turbers, and he said, oh, that Mary Turber, she was interested in everything. <laughs> Just the kind of person you want in a uh, museum. They uh, one up the other naturalists. Uh, they actually had a genus named for them, not just a species or subspecies, the genus Terveria. <laughs> they were very uh, serious uh, amateur scientists because uh, Terveria is a little microscopic uh, snail that is an ectoparasite on a sand dollar that lives in Baja, California. <laughs> and they found it. <laughs> Harry Turber uh, loved marine life so much, he figured out a way to set up a public aquarium as a satellite facility of this museum out on the Santa Cruz Wharf. And it was there during the 19, uh, late 30s and early 40s. This is the only photograph out of a prom promotional booklet, only photograph I've ever seen of the inside of the Santa Cruz uh, Aquarium. Budget for 1941-42. I'm not privy with the museum financials today, but I think they've gone up a little bit. Uh -huh. uh, those down at the bottom, fish food, $25 for the year. View of the entrance. You can't read it very well, but the sign there down at the bottom says, no swimsuits allowed. <laughs> After the Turvers left, the uh, remaining uh, committee uh, members uh, realized that they were just a committee. They really weren't, they didn't have any legal authority. And so they petitioned to the city council to be made into a museum commission 
uh, like the Parks and Recreation Commission, Police Commission, and so forth that we still have today. So the Museum Commission was established in, in 1947 with the responsible of, responsibility of overseeing the operation of the museum and advising the council on matters regarding the museum. And of course, most of the members were also hands-on volunteers here at the museum. They did have some problems, though, in the late 40s. This is 1949. Apparently, the city had a rule that you had to retire at age 70. And the museum caretaker, who was living upstairs in the building, uh, turned 70. And they couldn't find somebody else they could hire for $44 a month. So the museum was closed for about three months till they finally uh, found a new caretaker. In 19, uh, well, by the late 40s, early 50s, the uh, Terrell House was uh, starting to fall apart. A lot of problems with a leaky roof. Uh, people working there considered it a fire trap, not what you want for a museum. So the commission petitioned to have a uh, a uh, measure put on the ballot to temporarily increase property taxes to raise $50,000 to build a new museum building. Uh, there wasn't any formal opposition to it, but the commission didn't do a very good job of campaigning for it either, and unfortunately it uh, didn't pass. So the Tiro building in 1954 was condemned, and the museum had to move someplace else. Here, there's the building being torn down, and it moved into the building we're in now, which at that time was the Seabright Branch Library. And for a number of years, this was a combination library and museum. You might recognize this fish here. This is actually looking right inside the front door. Uh, it was just the front part of the building that was uh, existed at that time. And there was a fireplace right in the front uh, as you walk in the front door. This year is the 100th anniversary of the construction of the Seabright Branch Library. It was a Carnegie Library, one of 142 Carnegie Libraries uh, built in California. Built in 1915, uh, didn't formally open to the public until the following year. Early picture of the Seabright Branch Library, that's uh, artist Cor de Gaver, who was also a librarian here. That's her on the front steps. Very uh, well-known Santa Cruz artist of the middle 1900s. The only photo that I've ever seen of the back of this building before the two additions that we're sitting in now were added onto the building. During the 1950s, uh, another person very much involved with the museum was uh, uh, Alice Everett, who was a science teacher at uh, Mission Hill. Uh, my mother wished she had her as a science teacher. She got the other teacher. And <laughs> that Miss Everett was really good. Everybody liked her. <laughs> well, Robert Burton comes back into play in the 1950s, and he did one of the smartest things I think he ever did for this museum. Uh, he got busy with other things. He went into politics. He served on the city council and the board of supervisors. So he had to find somebody to replace him on the museum commission. And he heard about this man by the name of uh, Glenn Brott, who uh, was retired from the Michigan Department of Fish and Game. And he thought, well, there's somebody who could be good on the museum commission. So he called up Dr. Brott, and Dr. Brott said, no, I don't want to do that. You know, I'm retired. I don't want to be involved with a museum. And, but I guess uh, Bob Burton was very persuasive because Dr. Brott uh, finally agreed and joined the museum commission in 1960. Well, pretty soon he had adopted the title of uh, museum director, and he's changing things all around. And uh, during the 1960s, he... Uh, uh, among other things, uh, arranged, helped get two additions built onto this museum. The first 
room there that you see was built in 1962, greatly expanding the building. And then this room we're in now was added in 1968. So Dr. Brott really uh, carried the museum through the 1960s. He was really a perfect person for the job because he had a bachelor's degree in geology, a master's degree in zoology, and a PhD in memology. <laughs> Everybody called him Dr. Brott. I'm sure his wife, Kay, probably called him Glenn, but I don't know of anybody else who ever. It was always Dr. Brott. Well, Dr. Brott uh, got involved with this museum at an amazing period in Santa Cruz history, the 1960s. Most people don't think that much about the 1960s, but looking back, there were all kinds of changes going on. UCSC was uh, built, Cabrillo College was built, the Santa Cruz Small Craft Harbor was built, several elementary schools were constructed, uh, the new public library was built, county governmental center was built. <laughs> a lot of things going on, including two uh, new uh, wings onto this museum. And Dr. Brott uh, was very good at taking advantage of both UCSC and Cabrillo College. Uh, he got people from UCSC to serve on the uh, uh, museum commission, including the founding uh, librarian, Don Clark, and he got uh, Fred Shurier, who was my marine biology teacher at Cabrillo. He had him on the commission for a while and had him give talks. This is the fellow who told me about Indians in 1961. <laughs> really is, I remember him. Another view of the middle room there early on, uh, right after it was built. A little brochure about the, the museum. As I said, in 1968, this room was uh, added. This is the uh, opening reception. <laughs> Don't get me started on the animal heads. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Brott in uh, 1969, and I I'm sure he played a major role in this, though I'm, I'm sure there was a committee, uh, he, uh, uh, made another really smart move. He helped yeah. get the city to uh, approve the uh, hiring of a uh, permanent curator for the museum, and that was uh, Charles Prentice. So uh, Charles wasn't too long out of, just a few years out of uh, college when he came here from uh, Southern California to take the job. Uh, Charles uh, majored in uh, biology or zoology, I think, and with a minor in art. So he was really, you know, perfect uh, person for this kind of uh, uh, job. And I was reading just recently something that he wrote after he'd been here for a while, that he wrote that, well, you know, this 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 will be a great job. You know, I'll come, come work here for a year or two, whip it into shape, and then move on to something else. He retired 30 years later. <laughs> About the same time Charles started working here, the Oakland Museum was being constructed. And this was a major influence on uh, Charles. He'd go up there and they were very helpful. And a lot of the exhibits here in the 1970s that he did looked very similar in style to the exhibits that time at the Oakland Museum. Well, one of the things about Charles is that he really took advantage of local talent and ideas that people in the community had. Uh, when naturalist Alice Harper had an idea for, let's do an annual wildflower show, he said, uh, sure, let's, let's do it. And somebody got the idea for building a whale out front. And when a young photographer uh, by the name of uh, Franz Lanting was trying to get himself more established and wanted to do an exhibit on the animal migration, Charles said, let's do it. And then someone suggested, well, let's do an exhibit down at the boardwalk of robotic dinosaurs. You know, a little far out, but let's go for it.
or when a young uh, college student by the name of Frank Perry says he wants to build a relief map. <laughs> he said, let's go for it. So I put that together, had a lot of fun doing that. Now, as I remember the story, uh, I don't know who came up with the idea for the tide pool touch tank, but uh, Charles went up to the Steinhardt Aquarium to get advice on how to build something like this. And uh, they actually didn't encourage him all that much. They didn't think it would work too well. But they went ahead and did it anyway. That was back in about 1977. And it's still going strong. And curiously, not too long after that, the Steinhardt Aquarium built a touch tank. <laughs> as did a few years later, uh, Seacliff Beach uh, Visitor Center. Well, some strange things happened in the 70s. Uh, John Anderson took this picture. February of 76, snowed. May never happen again. <laughs> Snowball fights in Tyrrell Park. The 70s were a strange time. Uh, down in the, at City Hall, the city council started arguing about whether this museum should charge admission or not. And finally, someone said, well, I'll tell you what, you know, maybe as a compromise, we won't charge city residents, but we'll charge people who live outside the city ad admission to the museum. So one of the members who shall remain nameless uh, said, well, it's, uh, that's, that's the way we do the uh, city uh, landfill. So the next day in the Sentinel, this was the headline. <laughs> Now, they say there's no such thing as bad publicity, <laughs> but uh, I'm not sure about that. If you read the article, it's fine, but uh, some people only read the headlines. Well, in the late 70s, uh, there were threats of various uh, cutbacks and so forth. Uh, Proposition 13 passed, and the city for a while said, well, we may have to close the museum. So the Museum Association formed as the, a nonprofit support group uh, for the museum. Also, uh, another theme through the 70s, 80s, 90s, and right up to the early 2000s was the possibility of expanding the museum, uh, either here in Tyrrell Park or maybe build a whole new museum someplace else. None of those uh, ever happened, uh, but the museum found other ways to expand out into the community by doing uh, special exhibits in places like the library and had one at the Cooper House. Uh, this was an exhibit on the Chinese of the Monterey Bay region that was done at the Octagon Museum uh, based on uh, Sandy Leiden's book. Here's the inside. And also, the, uh, uh, a museum, a satellite museum, was set up uh, out at the Lighthouse. Originally, it was an exhibit with some displays on local history, but then some people came along and said, we'd like to do a, a museum on surfing history. And what a brilliant idea. I mean, this museum is the perfect spot, and I think it gets uh, more visitors than all the other museums in the county uh, combined. All about location. And the museum did uh, history and natural sciences displays out on the wharf in the 1980s when the wharf was uh, remodeled. Well, the plans to, uh, uh, the last plan to move the museum was in the early 2000s. Uh, there was talk about moving it, uh, building a new facility out near near a lagoon at Depot Park. And that didn't happen, but because of the desire for the museum to start having a presence at Neary Lagoon, the uh, present uh, Neary Lagoon uh, program with uh, school <coughs> tours was started. So that carries on. Also in the, in the 1980s, the, uh, the, middle, the museum was extensively uh, remodeled. And, uh, and so instead of being a library with a couple of add-ons, 
uh, it really became a museum, uh, a building. I hear the uh, desk is going to move back to this spot. Pre-whale. Oh, whoops, went back. Got to go back. So here's the museum staff in uh, 1994. Uh, now there's one person who uh, wasn't actually a staff person, was a, a volunteer, and that's Pat Smith in the upper right. But when I took this picture, I made sure that she got in the picture because she was practically a staff person. And probably a lot of here people tonight uh, did not know Pat, so I'll just tell you that uh, she got involved uh, with the museum along with her husband, uh, Kirk, in the very early 1980s, just when the Museum Association was starting up. And she was one of these super volunteers. Uh, for a while, she was wearing about five or six hats here. She was treasurer. She was running the gift shop. Uh, she was instrumental in the association hiring the, their first employee. Uh, when Charles wanted to uh, have silk screen signs in the museum, which were state of the art at that time, uh, Pat said, well, I, I could learn to do that. I could do photo silk screening. Uh, and thinking back on it all, I'd say that that's the key. I can't tell you the number of times that I heard Pat say, well, you know, somebody would come up with some idea that was a little bit out there, but she'd say, well, we can do that, you know? <laughs> Build a 20-foot-long paper mache whale for a parade? Sure, we can do that. And that can-do spirit uh, spilled, in, uh, spilled over into the whole uh, staff and other volunteers uh, a while back when the, the building needed painting and their city didn't have money to paint it. Uh, the staff and volunteers and board members and their kids all came with paint rollers and they painted the whole building. Now that's a can-do spirit. Well, Charles and, uh, and John Anderson, who was his main assistant, uh, they both uh, retired in about 1999, and uh, Greg Moise there in the center uh, was hired to uh, replace uh, Charles. Charles was actually, his title was curator. Greg, uh, he got the title of director. Um, and Greg did a great job, but by the early 2000s, the city was more and more cutting back on the, the museum, they cut uh, Sally Lagakis's position of taking care of the collections. And Greg kind of saw the writing on the wall, and so when he got an offer for a more secure job uh, elsewhere, understandably, he uh, took it. And, and then when, the, and when he left, uh, the city did not replace that position, at least not right away. Well, finally, in uh, December of 2008, uh, the city uh, decided not to fund the museum anymore and uh, let go all of the uh, city staff. Fortunately, the Museum Association by that time had grown to the point where it could take over the museum. And in fact, the museum never closed, even though uh, this picture was on the front page of the Santa Cruz Sentinel. <laughs> They say a picture is worth a thousand words. Unfortunately, this picture did a lot of damage. I uh, was talking with a friend of mine who for 20 years was running another nonprofit in the county and I mentioned to him a few months ago something about the Natural History Museum and he said, oh, that's the one that closed, right? <laughs> so I want everyone here tonight to declare war on that. <laughs> you gotta get the message out. The place is uh, still open. And still going strong with uh, school tours and uh, special exhibits. Lots of kids coming here. When you think back about the history, I mean, think back to when it was in the White House and the library and the high school, all these different places. Just think of the hundreds of thousands of people, maybe millions, who have uh, 
benefited from seeing the wonderful uh, collections and uh, exhibits. <clears throat> so what's the future from the for the museum? Well, I think the museum has a wonderful future coming up. Uh, Wonderful uh, museum has always attracted really great people uh, to run the place. And the museum has these fabulous, uh, irreplaceable collections, uh, which form the foundation for uh, exhibits and programs that will help connect people with nature for uh, many decades into the future, I'm sure. So thank you very much. Thank you.